Hello guys, it's Stripping the Dipping with your boy AMG Dens. And it's race week, which means we're going to Miami. Dun, 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 dun. Pro promoters are kinda jammy. Dun, 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 dun. Latifi tried to slam me. Dun, 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 dun. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, um, enough of the jingles, because it's time to introduce our guest. And listen, he might not be Valentino Rossi the doctor, but he goes by the name of Dr. Obbs. Bro, thank you so much for joining us on today's show. It's an absolute pleasure to have you on. And for our listeners, could you please give an introduction into your background and what like got you into F1 and following F1 tech? Yeah, thanks so much for the introduction, AMG Dens. Appreciate it. And and thanks for the the singing too, man. That was <laughs> thank you. That was pretty epic. Yeah, good job. That's <laughs> definitely not in my repertoire. I don't think I can bring any any smooth singing like that. But yeah, so they call me Dr. Obbs. I have uh I have my PhD in uh fluid dynamics and mechanical engineering. So that's why uh that's why I go by the doctor in there. But um motorsport is a passion of mine it's an interest i'm a tech head um i don't work actually in the motorsport industry i work in the energy industry but i've been doing technology development for over 15 years so i have a lot of interest in technology Um, but what really got me into motorsport um was the first time i was about 1987 when i was a young kid i was in san antonio and i saw a race through the streets of san antonio and i was hooked I mean, it was just incredible. And then from there, um, drove go-karts for just a bit, not much competitively or anything like that, just sort of for fun. And then uh, as I was going through school, I was on the formula team actually in college, the formula racing team. I was on charge of the suspension side of things. Didn't do such a great job there, <laughs> which is maybe why I switched over to fluid mechanics. But yeah, I've been a, I've been a fan of uh, Formula One for quite some time um, and uh, only really got deep into the technical side of Formula One, I would say over the last two and a half years. Yeah. Man, that's awesome, and it's so cool to kind of hear an organic kind of way into Formula One as well, because most of us, we end up just watching it on the TV, or, you know, we have a friend of a friend that watches it, and then, you know, we get hooked that way. But it, again, just from listening to your, your background as well, you've been exposed from quite an early age to motorsport and following it through. Also, I wish that my school had, like, a motorsport team or, like, a track racing team or something like that as well. That's so cool, like, you know. Yeah, it's it's really big, actually. There's this quite people that that tend to get into formula one and a lot of the engineers that end up working for formula one teams actually come through the the formula sae programs that the different universities have especially in the u.s yeah Ah, that's awesome and hopefully england might be able to match that soon as well because there's been a huge push kind of on the social side you know for them to open up jobs and to kind of give kids from uh you know stem backgrounds science technology english maths uh the opportunities to kind of get into those fields as well and you know to practice their dreams so of course you know we love Mm -hmm. to see it and it's great as well to see in america that the foundations are already there so if you work hard enough for it and you're really passionate you know those opportunities are just around the corner so that's excellent okay dr obs we'll get into our first question of the day then um, and it's observation more into Imola. So we saw a very like rain adversely affected uh, weekend in Imola. We just wanted to find out what were your observations uh, just throughout the way that the new cars behaved with these uh, more interchangeable track conditions. And just from your perspective as well, Dr. Obbs, do you think that Mercedes perhaps made a mistake by not pitting Lewis earlier in those uh, interchanging conditions when the track went from intermediate slash wet to uh, almost like dry conditions? Yeah, it's a uh, the Imola race was really interesting because I think one of the things coming into Imola that I was really uh, keeping my eye out for was how these new cars with the new regulations and all the downforce generating aero elements would survive some of these massive curbs that you have in Imola. And it seems like uh, everything was okay, right? We weren't losing any uh, underfloor tunnel fences or we weren't losing any brake winglets or anything. So it seems like the cars are robust, which is kind of the first thing that I was looking for. And the second thing I was looking for was Um, you know, with the changing conditions like we had with the rain, this was going to be the first race where we had these cars running in the wets. And how would they, how would they do in the wets? There were some people that were thinking, well, you know, because of how low they run the cars, you could potentially uh, actually hydroplane. So 
the center section of the floor, which is the big beefy portion right in the middle. When you look at the underside of a car, that's called the boat. And it literally does look like a boat. And so some people were saying, well, you could actually start to hydroplane off the boat. But thankfully, it didn't happen, right? We didn't have any cars <laughs> spinning out of control, I guess, besides maybe Charles Leclerc. So sorry to any, you know, Ferrari fans. That Tifosi's out there. <laughs> yeah, Bobby's exactly. I love the yeah. Tifosi. Yeah, I'm, I'm, part, I'm part Italian as well. So that's okay. You know, I, I'm with them there. <laughs> But, um, you know, the cars handled really well on the wet. Um, I was quite surprised. I think the thing that was also kind of surprising to me was to see um, how long the tires actually lasted. So the from what we've been seeing from other races, some teams are do, doing much better with tire management than others, right? I think generally speaking, Mercedes has been really good on tire management. They can get the tires to last a long time, uh, which is really good for them. But the downside of that is it takes a while for them to heat the tires up, right? So that's kind of the flip side of that. On the other hand, Red Bull you know, has had problems with tire management in previous races where the tires have fallen off quite quickly. Now, some of that is probably due to the fact that they're very much overweight. And in Imola, um, they rolled out an upgrade that dropped the, dropped the weight of the car. So it seems like the tire management was better, but Ferrari had some issues with tire management. But the Inters actually lasted quite long. I was quite surprised with, with that. But as far as pitting Lewis, yeah, I mean, I think... I was on another podcast and and they asked me a question about Lewis and, you know, what's been going on. And I think he's just was, has been unfortunate with, with where he's been stuck in the pack, um, being stuck behind the DRS train. And then when they did pit him, him coming out, you know, again, back in the DRS train yeah. was so unfortunate. I mean, and Imola is a track where you just don't have a lot of room to pass and there's not a lot to work with. And there was only one DRS zone, right? So I think it was just an unfortunate situation. And yeah, I think Lewis was unfortunately caught a bit on the back foot with when they chose to pit him, yeah. Yeah, absolutely agree with you on that as well, Dr. Obbs. It's a great observation as well that you made earlier, just in relation to how these cars are behaving with new regulations. And surprisingly, we thought that they were a bit like clumsy and cumbersome in the dry conditions. We thought that that might also be the case in, in race uh, scenarios as well, but it actually seems that they've managed to tidy them up and give them a bit more uh, move, uh, movability as well in, in such yes. kind of corners, low speed and also high speed. And yet, even during the race, there actually wasn't much drama in terms of like drivers losing control of the cars or like, you know, cars, like as you said, aquaplaning, probably because of the mm -hmm. ride height um, tips that you, you also alluded to as well. And then, yeah, coming back to that Lewis Hamilton thing too, like, yeah, I thought it was quite unfortunate, the timing of it, because I reckon maybe if he'd pitted a lap before, or maybe, um, you know, maybe had gone a bit more brave with the approach, perhaps he would have been able to get the undercut on those pack of cars uh, in kind of like the top 10 down section. But like you said as well, just, um, a poorly uh, time pit stop getting kind of stuck behind them too and yeah i guess when you're following another car as well you've got a lot of spray coming into the the visor obviously and that might give you the illusion that it's raining probably more than it is which could have maybe clouded his judgment when the team asked him whether it was time to jump onto the, the slicks or not but also yeah. just another thing as well doctor i wanted to get your take on because a lot of people i think they're being quite ignorant to how big of a factor it is could you explain like how a drs train works and why it is like if you're at the back of a DRS train, why it becomes increasingly harder to overtake even with these newer cars. Yeah, so uh, th these cars this year, maybe to to someone that's not deep into the tech, the the aero performance of these cars is drastically different than it was in years past. So in years past, um, you had most of your downforce generating elements were at you know, on, on the top side of the car, right? The whole underside of the car was completely flat and really acting like uh, ex essentially an extended diffuser. But those surface uh, aero elements like the rear wings and all the barge boards and, and all the hot brake air coming through the wheels was all creating a massive wake. And that wake uh, has a couple of, adv one advantage and one disadvantage. Well, a, a few, right? So the disadvantage is that when you have dirty air behind a car, you lose massive amount of downforce because your surface aero elements are creating your downforce, right? Mm -hmm. Which is different this year where you have a lot of your downforce generated by your underfloor tunnels, which are more um, uh, accepting of, of the air and the wake behind a car. But Additionally, the 
change in the regulations is now also meant that the wake is a lot cleaner so cars can naturally follow closer right which is what they were really trying to do but the downside of that is that the impact of the um slipstream is less okay because the the wake is being channeled up further vertically instead of coming out more sort of horizontally and behind the car so the slipstream impact is less so this is why they need the drs because what the drs does is now causes you to immediately shed some drag by opening the rear wing so you have less drag and you have more forward speed so the air is resisting you less and when you get into a drs train everybody in that train that's within one second of the drs detection zone has the same drs now ideally what would happen is that the person in the very front of that train that does not have drs would get overtaken Right, that's that's what usually would happen, and that probably is what would happen on a track where you had multiple DRS zones. Sure. Now in Imola, where you have one DRS zone, and that car in front was a Williams, which was running a very low downforce setup. What that means is that you had a naturally fast car in the straights at the beginning of that DRS train, and nobody else behind them could pass. So sure. Alex Albon was really leading that train. So. So naturally what happens in the in the DRS train is that is that you have a lot of cars in a straight line which are benefiting equally and the fact that this year because the the wake has been cleaned up you don't get the slipstream on the straights where you don't have a DRS as much as you would have in the years past and that might have been a chance for you to get a bit closer before a DRS detection zone by by sitting in someone's slip slipstream. And so you don't have that this year as it's not as powerful as it was in previous years. So the, I think this year we're going to have a lot more of those problems where we're going to have cars sitting in a DRS train that simply can't pass. Thank you for that, Dr. Ops. And I think that's an excellent kind of explanation because it really does kind of show you kind of how the cars have moved in a different direction, obviously, to the way they react in a DRS train, as you've explained. And also, I think just for those who maybe they're not so knowledgeable, there's lots of nuggets of information in there which are quite key because I understand, you know, that people love to have banter and say, oh, Lewis Hamilton stuck behind a Williams. And for them, they might find that kind of thing funny. But, you know, I think it also comes to reason that if you understand the technical reasoning behind that as well it gives you a lot more insight as to why these things occur why they happen so thank you for that and um moving on to our next question then um what is the purpose of a cypod and how does a cypod affect the car's performance this was one of our fan questions oh great question so firstly a side pod is there because you need to place cooling elements in some location where you can have air to cool those elements so you can have center line cooling which is what you've got that massive air scoop which sits right behind the driver's head right that's the center line cooling or you can have the side pod cooling and the side pod cooling is naturally where you get a nice amount of clean air sometimes the air that's coming right over the top of the driver's head can be a little dirty because actually the most flow disruption you're going to get is from the actual place where the driver sits within the monocoque right so that is going to be very disturbed air and you you want to get naturally clean air in through the center line but sometimes the side pods then can be a place where you can get uh, additional air as well so that's the first reason why you have a side pod is so you can place cooling elements now the other reason is more of an aero reason because um, if somebody on the powertrain team is telling you, look, I need a place to put all my cooling elements because I can't let everything get hot, right? So I'm talking about engine cooling, battery system cooling, oil, MGUK, MGUH. I mean, all the other elements that get very hot, electrical cooling, all these things need to find a way to actually cool those elements so they don't overheat. If a powertrain person tells you I need that, then an aero person is going to decide on how they can take that and make it aerodynamically beneficial, right? Sure. And so that is effectively what you then do with a side pod is you say, okay, I need this. So how can I use it? Now teams this year have, because we don't have the barge boards, the barge boards were there to also help shape the flow that's going around to the rear section of the car. And so naturally when you looked at last year's cars, you had very minimal side pod designs, kind of very similar to sort of what the Williams has or maybe what Mercedes has, maybe a little bit more. 
Um, but you had the barge boards to then take care of all the arrow shaping and all the tire wake management and things like that from the front tires. Because you don't have that this year, you have to use the side pods as well as the floor fences. So if you look at the, the floor, right, the entries to the floor have all these things that look like shark's teeth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Those things are also helping to kind of control and manage the wake that's coming off of the front tire. So as the air goes over the front tire, it goes over the backside and it sheds all kinds of vortices and you have a lot of dirty air and dirty air just means it's low energy air and that low energy air. You don't want coming to any of your rear downforce generating elements like your rear wing, or your beam wing or your floor edge, your diffuser, any of these things where you're generating a lot of downforce, you don't want that air going back there. So what do you do? You create a side pod, which creates a little bit of a flow disturbance that now you create a very high pressure zone. And then it helps to sort of push out that tire wake away from the rear portion of the car. So that's another arrow reason why you have a side pod. But really, it, and the basis of it is because you need a place where you can put cooling elements, and that's just the best place to put it. But something that Mercedes has been able to do with their design is find very clever, innovative ways to actually place their cooling architecture either behind the driver and sort of the center line cooling or sort of, you know, parallel to the side of the monocoque kind of running along the side to, to allow them to cool more effectively. So that's one of the reasons why they were able to do that. Yeah. Excellent. And in a way, Doctor, it's like you can almost read into the future of my uh, my my like uh, checklist there of questions I wanted to ask you because this is a <laughs> great segue into the next kind of question we have. So, like this is set the scene. Obviously, we started the new year with Mercedes probably being the favorites at that time because obviously they're the eight-time world champions. Everybody in testing was saying that they were sandbagging, and obviously they brought out this really radical, almost like no pod, zero pod, side pod, and um through that kind of like observation, I guess, we've seen that throughout this, the development of the season, first four races, they haven't really been able to make the mark that they should. And a lot of what we're gathering is perhaps it's because the car isn't able to run in a setup window that allows it to excel without it porpoising. And one observation I think I made from a Ted Kravitz kind of tech talk was he was blaming the porpoising issues on the zero side pods because in his analysis, he was essentially saying that because the, the Mercedes has a very scooped kind of uh, side profile with these uh, zero side pods, the floor has nothing really to support it other than the stay, which is like a wire or almost a cable or some sort of like metallic kind of um, thing that connects, I, I guess, it to the main body of the, the chassis to the actual like floor itself. And because there's like no surface area there, when a, the car is driving at really high speeds, the floor is moving up and down because it doesn't have that kind of integral support to keep mm -hmm. it. Whereas obviously with the Ferrari and it's much wider side pods, which is like mounted more like closely to the outside of the um, the, the barge board area and the, the kind of side area as well. There's less kind of flex in the floor itself. So therefore, although it does suffering suffer from porpoising, the integral part is that it's not like reattaching and attaching and stalling so aggressively under the brakes in the same way that the Mercedes is, which perhaps is one of many key areas they're losing time. What's your mm -hmm. thought on that philosophy? Because obviously that's just like a pundit kind of giving their two cents on what the yeah. issue could be. And yeah, like, could you maybe perhaps give us your own insight into why Mercedes have struggled so far this year? Yeah, sure. No, it's a it's a very um, intricate question with a lot of detail, and and I would say without without the you know really having the computational fluid dynamic simulations for the Mercedes, you know what I'll give you will be really my opinion um, based off of you know what I've seen and what what I know as far as you know aerodynamic fundamentals. But I think what Ted is mentioning, I, I don't necessarily buy it. Um, because I think if that was the case, then the minute you put the stay, uh, it would have gone away <laughs> and it didn't. So, sure. and, and if the stay was, if the stay was maybe not beefy and, you know, thicker, thick enough to actually retain the floor, you would just put a bigger stay on it. Um, so I don't think it's that simple. Um, I think Mercedes is 
suffering from multiple things, if you ask me, that, that are causing them to, to have problems. I think it begins firstly with the fact that they've chosen to go with a very aggressive design. And, you know, like I said in the intro, I've spent quite a lot of time in technology development. One of the things you learn is that when you design something, so when you innovate, you can choose to go down a very innovative path that is so different than anything that you know, but you will be accepting a level of risk with that decision. And the risk is that you might not fully understand it, but you will eventually understand it, right? So you're kind of committing to the long game. Um, if you cho choose maybe a less risky path when you innovate, then you're taking the safer direction and you know that you'll probably understand the fundamentals of the design better. I think firstly, very innovative, risky way that probably has a high risk, high reward, sort of a sort of a model. And it seems like initially, and, and to, to their own credit, I mean, you know, it's incredibly innovative. They've done a lot of work to package it to make it happen that I don't think other teams can do if they wanted to adopt it. But it's been very difficult for them to understand um, its performance and how it works. And I think they've even admitted that themselves, right? Is that they're still trying to understand the car. They're still trying to understand, you know, how it's working and, and what's tripping the porpoising. The latest information I've heard is that they now understand what's tripping the porpoising. They're just trying to figure out now how to, to maybe control it or to, to bring it back. And when you remove a side or not remove but have a minimal side pod like they have it start my first thing that i start to think of is what we talked about before with why do you have a side pod which is now how are you going to manage the front tire wake because the front tire wake that's coming off of there is again very dirty air and if you don't have the larger side pod what aero elements are you going to use to try to push away that wake i think one of the things they have done is in that that sort of, you know, that floor, uh, not floor, sorry, the mirror kind of wing that they have, which was really cool interpretation of the regulations, I have to say. I think that was pretty awesome. Um, but it is very down washing and out washing at the same time. So what does that mean? That means that the air that comes to it is now going to be pushed down and out, right? So down and out washing. So I think they're trying to use that to help sort of push any front tire wake that maybe is a little bit higher down and out away from the rear section of the car. Um, but I think they also could potentially be suffering from a bit draggy setup because the rear tire now is not having, so that the side pod is not able to deflect the, the incoming air around and sort of away from the rear tire. So that rear tire is taking the brunt of the incoming air. And the rear tire is a big down, um, drag generator for an open wheel racer. So if you're not able to sort of control how much air is coming to the rear tire, you could get a, an inherently draggy car. But I think on the positive side of it, they're getting a massive amount of air to the rear portion of the vehicle, to the rear portion of the race car, generate all your downforce. So if you can get a lot of air to the rear portion of the car, then that means you can work your diffuser much harder. So to put this, I guess, into a bit, you know, better way to sort of explain it, when you bring air through the, through the ground effect tunnels now, you're going to generate a lot of downforce through the mid section of the floor, like right where the driver sits, okay? Because that's where you're going to reduce the pressure as you accelerate the flow. But you're going to also generate a whole lot of downforce right at the line where the diffuser starts. Now, the Mercedes has a, I believe it's got a double kick diffuser, which means instead of having a single line where you go from, you know, having the floor to now the diffuser, they've got sort of two steps, right? And with that, you can actually drive the diffuser much harder when you have a lot more air going around the rear part of the diffuser on the outside, because what it does is it reduces the local pressure, which now means the diffuser can be pushed a lot harder. And that diffuser, the diffuser itself is not generating the downforce, but it's allowing you to suck air through the tunnels much faster, which then is gonna generate more downforce. So 
I understand the theory of the design. It makes complete sense. I think they're just possibly having a hard time managing some of the front tire wake and also some of how clean the air is that's getting to the rearward portion of the car that maybe is not helping with tripping off some of the porpoising. Sure. And I think that really is a good explanation as well as to how it works. And even for now, it, although it doesn't really seem to be the correct philosophy of the ones we have, it still has quite a lot of potential and it might yeah. be an upgrade or two, which helps it unlock that that uh, potential to help it perform and, you know, get the performance that they want to see and correlate that probably with the things they have in the, the sim and the wind tunnel, obviously what's happening on track as well. So great. Really happy we discussed that as well. And yeah, the and next maybe question, just... Maybe Maybe just before we skip to the next one. Sure. Ah, sorry. Sorry to interrupt. So maybe before, I, I want to clarify one thing, I guess. I think that the design itself has a very high ceiling. Okay. So um, I think that there's a lot of potential there. And if they can control it, as you say, and they can roll out some upgrades, I think naturally their design puts them in a better place to where they can get much more air to the rear Coke section of the car over the rear downforce generating elements, which means that their ceiling potentially is higher maybe than other teams. They can't do that. Of course. And yeah, I totally agree with you on that as well, um, Dr. Robson. It definitely seems like the way it is as well, just from the things you've mentioned, it definitely does have a higher ceiling. And, you know, it, in that kind of sense as well, it's interesting that they're just one of only a couple of teams that have taken such a radical design. And with it being Mercedes, you'd think that there might be something that they know that maybe the other teams don't know, or maybe as Gunter Steiner had put it in earlier kind of uh, preseason testing as well, because of the resources that a team like Mercedes has, they have the finances and obviously the, um, the kind of, I guess, personnel to make something like that work, whereas a much smaller team might not be able to go with such a radical design. And therefore, they might go with something a bit more standard or traditional, but they can understand the parameters and limitations of Absolutely. that uh, like body language as well. So yeah, great, great analysis and insight into that too. So on to the next question, which I feel kind of more plays to you know your background and the things that you've studied and the achievements that you've made in that segment too. What does a suspension, what role does suspension play in F1 in relation to the way the cars behave? And I'm really proud of myself for this word I'm going to use as well. How does the elasto kinematics, big word, I'm going to use that when I go to the bars next time. <laughs> how does the elasto kinematics play with the new 18 inch Pirelli tires? Yeah. Yeah, no, good question. Um, so I, let's, I, I'm someone that always starts with the basics to try to explain something. So I think sure. it just makes sense to paint the picture. So what has changed this year from, from last year, right, as far as the suspensions? So one of the things, well, we can't, you can't have any hydraulic inducing uh, suspension elements this year. So for instance, teams used to have hydraulic heave dampers and they, they're not allowed to have that anymore. There's other things like um, the inerters that, that teams used to have, that, which helps to sort of damp out some harmonic oscillations that you might get, right? If, if you've got a vibration because you've got a, a curb strike or something like that, then it helps to dampen the peaks of that movement by using the inertia of a flywheel. That's what an inerter does. So you can't have those elements anymore either. Also, you're not allowed to have any of the change in ride height control like Merck had in the W12 last year. If you remember, With the it was really trick. Down on the streets, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah, it was super trick where when you got to a certain amount of downforce, the car would squat down and it'd allow you to basically stall the diffuser, which stalling the diffuser, by the way, is not necessarily always a bad thing. It's a bad thing if you're doing it into a corner, but if you're in a straight, Actually, it helps you to shed drag, which is actually good. Um, but that, you know, that is not allowed anymore. So all of the elements now in the suspension have to be mechanical, mechanical elements, right? So you've got torsion bars, you know, uh, which are there, right? Instead of coil springs. Why? Because they're a lot um, smaller to package, right? Than a large uh, linear spring. So generally the whole suspension dynamics has changed and now on top of that you've also changed the tire as you mentioned because the you know elasto kinematics what does that mean right so um if you've got a, a tire that has a really large sidewall then 
that uh, elastomer, that the way that that elastomer behaves in between the contact patch, which is the topmost portion of the tire, and the rim, which again is you know turning, the rim is turning based off of the steering input. So you've got a relative motion between the tire and the rim itself in the contact patch. The larger that gap is, the the amount of elastomer that is there, you're going to have more relative motion, right? So the tire may be sitting in the contact patch area, and then the rim is actually turning, and you're getting a lot of flex in between. So now when you don't have that, and it's a much thinner sidewall, that means you should theore theoretically have a much more responsive car because that flex is also, you're losing responsiveness in that flex as well. So that's the downside of it. But the upside of it is that rubber that's in between your contact patch and your wheel rim is also acting a bit as a damper, right? So it's also helping to kind of damp out some of the shock and the vibration that you're going to get in curb strikes and things like that. So now naturally you have a much more mechanically coupled system, which means that when you have a, a shock that comes to a tire because you hit a curb strike or you're going over a bump on the road, that force is going to be better translated into the suspension. So the suspension now is going to have to absorb a lot more than maybe it did in years past. Oh, and on top of that, like I said, they've removed all of the little tricks that engineers would use to try to make the suspension better. <laughs> so it's a big challenge this year. Absolutely. And I think we've seen kind of different teams taking different approaches just in the way they, they set that up. And even a lot of talk of obviously like the, um, what is it, the active suspension perhaps making a return at some stage because of the porpoising yeah. issues. But then yeah. probably the, the more likely thing with the FIA would just say, well, you know, some teams like Red Bull have got onto the porpoising issues. Why don't the rest of you get onto it as well? Which we'll touch on a bit later on in the show. But yeah, like and there was actually a there was actually a really good um, interview. Um, I'm trying to remember. It was P Peter Windsor uh, put out a an interview with uh, Summer Somerville. Uh, I can't remember his name anyway. He was with the with the FIA, and he said that they asked the teams. They said, look, you know, we can limit the ride height because what's tripping off the issues that are happening with the porpoising is because the teams are running the car so low, right? And then once you generate the downforce, now you choke the flow to the diffuser and then you stall it and then you lose the downforce. And so what the FIA said is, look, we can limit it. We can put a cap on ride height and nobody can run lower than this cap. And then there shouldn't be any problems with porpoising. And they offered that solution to the teams, but the teams chose against it. They did not want it. They wanted to solve it themselves and figure out what was going on. So to me, that kind of tells me that the teams are quite confident that they're going to get their head around it. And some teams are going to get their head around it, you know, sooner than others, right? Just based off of where they were in their initial design. But I thought that was quite telling that the teams are very confident. They think they're going to get their heads around this and they would much rather uh, allow the design freedom to run the cars as low as they need to and then and then they're just going to sort out the porpoising yeah i agree with you and you know maybe that touches on the kind of things we mentioned earlier too where there is a lot of potential out there with the times in these cars it's just a case of them having more time i guess at the factory and data collection as well to correlate those um, understandings and to bring to life maybe the uh the, the upgrades and also the little tricks and things they want to do to make the car work in that window a lot better to correlate it with uh you know the things that they have in the cfds and stuff like that as well and i agree and then also yeah and it's it's very telling like you mentioned too because you have on one side them saying well listen we'll sort the porpoising out but then on the other side a lot of the teams were quite cheeky to ask the FIA to kind of sort out the, the weight limits and to give them a kind of dispensation <laughs> on that too yeah, so yeah. yeah like that that's really intriguing and I think a great insight into that too and to kind of caveat the earlier question we we're talking about with the this new 18 inch Pirelli tire which is headed obviously by Mario Isla the president of the, the Pirelli board why is it that we're seeing certain teams like Mercedes and Red Bull struggle with the initial tire warm-up like for example i think mercedes often do two qualifying runs which i think is crazy yeah. to know that they have that amount of uh, kinetic energy from the battery to be able to deploy you know so much energy for a hot lap to do that mm -hmm. but then also we've seen in team radios to max sometimes them saying max 
just take it easy, you know, with these tires in the first couple of laps, let them build. And obviously Max be Max to be like, no, I want to push. I'm a racing driver. <laughs> Leave me alone. I know what I'm doing. Give me, give me yeah. a mask as well. So yeah. Why is that? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. Um, I think we have to also kind of go back to the beginning also of what's changed in the regulations this year around tire warm up. So if you look at last year's previous re regulations and even in the 2021 cars, um, teams were able to use brake heat. So heat that's generated from the brakes to heat the wheels, which would thereby heat the tires. Cough, so cough, fundam break magic. Yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, maybe a sore subject for our listeners, right? Um, but but the, the truth of the matter is the way that the teams have to heat the tires up this year is drastically different than what they've been doing in the past. So this is a whole new area for teams. Um, no longer are they allowed to actually blow cooling air through the wheel rim because what that does is that actually creates a massive wake as well. So again, along the lines of cleaning up the wake, they said, look, no more blowing air through the wheel rim and out you know, the side of the car. So they said, any air that comes in through the front duct needs to come out of a back duct. And so that cleans everything up. And actually the drum that covers the entire brake assembly is sealed. So it's uh so you're not able to get any air out even if you wanted to so that's the that's the main thing is that teams now are having to rely on actual driving to heat it up i mean they can do things with like brake bias and such to try to generate a little bit of heat and they can do other things like maybe um you know change the amount of understeer they have so the tires slip a little bit more and then you generate heat from slip but the downside of that is that you're going to degrade your tires faster so what are teams what are some teams struggling with um i think starting with mercedes um they as you rightfully said dens are are struggling with heat up they're having to do two warm up laps before setting their qualifying lap which really is not normal and this problem was really exacerbated or amplified in imola where you had cold temperatures and then you had rain right which makes it even worse and i think personally that the reason that they're suffering from this is because we don't have the same secondary heating that we would have had from the brakes you're generating all of your heat from the contact patch so from how that elastomer is interacting with the track and the heat and the energy that's being dissipate, dissipated as you're trying to turn the car, that's generating your heat. And so if Mercedes is bouncing and porpoising like they are into the corners, then what's going to happen is you're going to load the tire, then you're going to unload the tire, load the tire, unload the tire, and it's kind of a cyclic sort of a sense, which means you're going to have very high energy dissipated dissipation and low energy dissipation as the tire bounces and that's not ideal you want very continuous load that the tire is under so you can generate that heat so i think their issue is primarily due to porpoising um, they've probably also done some things with their setup which maybe doesn't allow them to run as much downforce as they want to because of you know, how bad the porpoising gets. And that's another thing, right? That could also be uh, hampering them or, or causing them to have some difficulties. So I think if you fix the porpoising issue, I think that fixes the tire issue for Mercedes. Now for Red Bull, it was their weight that was really causing them to have problems, which is why, um, you know, the team was telling Max to bring the tires in gently. And the reason for that is, again, what we talked to, before you don't have the means of generating heat as quickly in the tire so you're doing it during the actual race and if you stress those tires too much then what's going to happen is you're going to generate peaks of heat and then that heat is going to drop it's not going to be continuous heat throughout the tire throughout the core of the tire which is going to cause graining that's how graining happens so you you get basically the tire that gets hot and starts to move and then it cools and that's what ends up happening when you don't have continuous or you know even heat distribution through the tire and that's uh, one of the downsides of not having the brake um, the brakes actually helping you with the heating 
So teams have to really be very easy with bringing the tires in and generating nice continuous heat through the tire that's evenly distributed. Then you've got the, the, the tire in the race window, and then, you know, it's, it's sort of behaving like normal. Excellent. And yeah, just I agree with you on that as well in terms of just how, in a way, the two different teams have the, the kind of, even though it fundamentally, I guess, is the same problem in a wide sense, the problems are very diverse in the way they play out. And it's unique from car to car, as you, you explained with the Mercedes and just, it's almost like a lean towards the purposing issues that they're having. And then with Red Bull, it's more on like the weight side. And then one, yeah. there seems to be a thing where it's like, it happens just all the time with Mercedes, whereas with Red Bull, it's more the approach they want to go for racing because definitely with the Red Bull, you can see at times, to me as well, it just looks slightly more playful. I was watching like Max chasing down Leclerc in Jeddah and you can see in all the low speed corners on the exit, like, and it's probably Max's driving style as well, but you can just see that slight kind of slip angle out of each kind of mid-entry mm -hmm. corner on the exit as well and how the 18-inch tyre of course reacting to that style of driving too and I guess we're yet really to see kind of what driving style is superior for it whether or not you know I guess we've seen elements of the whole tire whisperer thing come into it as well shout out to <laughs> Auburn of course in Australia for yeah, that yep. magnificent drive so yeah just, it's so fascinating I guess to kind of keep an eye on and I guess the season plays out we'll see how that and, works even and more. I think these these cars are demanding so much more of the drivers this year because they are having to change their driving style I mean, that's something that Max talked about, you know, other drivers have talked about that as well, that they're, they're having to adapt their driving style to these new cars. I mean, just the way that they generate downforce is totally different than, than previous year's cars. And I think some drivers are maybe adapting to that a little bit better than other drivers. Uh, we saw it with Seb. Right. When Seb, you know, our poor guy had COVID, right. <laughs> and lost mm. his drive for a couple races, but when he came back, I mean, he struggled. He, he really struggled, right? It was Australia, I think, right? So, um, you know, he just to understand the car, you can do as much work as you can in the simulator, right? Which is their first pass at really trying to get it done outside of the track. But there's nothing like racing on the track. I mean, it's that your models and your simulations do their best to try to emulate what's happening in the real world. But um, the real world is the real world. And, and, getting time in the seat is the best thing. And so some drivers are maybe not adapting to it as quickly as others. Um, with the Red Bull, for instance, one of the issues with their weight was that, as you you know properly said, they had a whole lot of slip. And so they, they had massive understeer in the corners. And Max is not good with an understeering car, but Checo is, right? So that's why you saw Checo with so much pace. Um, versus maybe last year when Checo was in the seat and the car was set up to be very pointy, so it had a lot of oversteer, and Checo struggled with that to understand the car. Um, so yeah, this year has been a, not only a challenge for engineering, you know, and and the designers and everybody to get the cars into what they would consider a performance, you know, band, but also for the drivers to extract that performance from the car because the the driving styles are changing. Sure. And yeah, I think it gives you a lot of food for thought there as well in terms of how they go about approaching the driving style to refine it. And I think a great example he gave there as well is just, again, the whole Max and uh, obviously Sergio thing too. Because I think when Sergio got the role at Red Bull, like a lot of people that hadn't watched Sergio throughout his career at Salba and the original, I'm not talking about this PE party us Aston Martin racing point outfit we have now, like the original OG, uh, like Force India, like you know, Perez yeah. had an amazing kind of like run, and then when he came in, he took a while to adapt. But then you see, like as you mentioned as well, with these newer cars, that kind of more, like I guess slow speed understeer characteristic that the cars have is more suited to his driving style, and he does quite well with that, and also keeping the tires alive and in a window where he can continue to progressively and consistently, you know, make his way for a, a Grand Prix as well. So that's awesome. But then just moving on to our next question, which is from the boss, the the woman herself. She's like I said earlier this week. She's like uh, the Manisha Cattleborn. She's like the team principal. She is like you know <laughs> stripping the dipping herself. 
herself. Yeah. It's Miss, you know, Georgina Donna. She came up with this really great fantasy question, which I'm really looking forward to asking you. So, Dr. Ubbs, um, let me, let's put it this way. So, Adrian Newey says, you know what? I'm done with Red Bull. Like, I've had my time there. I've had my time at McLaren. I've had my time at Williams. I'm going to create my own F1 team. Screw that. <laughs> and I want to employ Dr. Ubbs as, you know, head of obviously the, the technical side and more to do with the suspension and the geometry and just the behave the mechanical grip i guess aspect of the car in that way um what would you go for would you go for a push rod or a pull rod suspension and you know for our listeners at home could you explain the difference between how a, a push rod and pull rod suspension works <laughs> this is a good question. Shout out Georgina. Good one. <laughs> um, so it's a very difficult question to answer. And the reason is because you can ask 10 teams and you'll get 10 different answers. Responses, sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, so, I mean, essentially what you've got is, you know, difference between push rod and pull rod, right? I mean, the first thing to notice with a push rod configuration, I mean, right. So pushing, you know, the pushing into the rocker arms, right, is push rod and pulling the rocker arms is pull rod. So the biggest difference, though, is the location where they mount. So in a push rod configuration, your rocker arms are going to be mounted high. So they're going to be up. So if you could, you know, just picture the nose, right? And the very top surface of the nose up or, you know, around where the steering wheel is along that planar edge, is where you're going to mount your suspension components then in a push rod configuration, right? Mm -hmm. The downside of that is that those elements, and remember, think back to what I said previously about how all these little tricks that the teams used to use in their suspension is now gone. So they have to use mechanical suspension elements, which are heavier than the previous years so now what you're doing is you're mounting all these heavier suspension elements higher in the car on the nose which raises your center of gravity so you want your center of gravity naturally for your whole car to be as low as possible because then you don't get as much body lean and roll and all these things that are you know detrimental to performance right you want to keep that as low as possible so when you put those suspension elements higher, it comes at the downside of the center of gravity. But the upside is that it's higher in the car and it's easier to work on. So when you need to make adjustments and things like that, you can do that much easier. Um, contrary to now a pull rod where you're going to put that lo mounting location now on the bottom side of the nose, which is very close to where the driver's feet are. So now you need to figure out how to package it because most, most Formula One cars, the way that they would prefer to, to design the nose is to make the bottom of the nose, um, if, you, if you look at it or, you know, in the Y plane, how wide it is to make it slimmer, not as wide in the bottom and wider on the top, right? It's kind of like a natural sort of an uh, you know, upsloping effect. And when you put the uh the the elements of the suspension now the rocker arms lower you, you can't do that anymore so it has to be now a, a beefier section in the lower part of the nose and you have to figure out how to package it the center of gravity is lower right we talked about that so that's the positive the negative side now if i need to work on it i need access to those elements it's much harder to get to the other difference you're pulling the the actual arm is in tension and so it you can make it thinner you can make it smaller in tension because um because it's stronger in that sense versus a push rod where it's the opposite right it has to be a little bit thicker so from an arrow standpoint there's a trade-off there but the other side of it on the arrow front and i think this is why most teams are going or most teams end up going with a um I say most teams, it's two teams. It's Red Bull and McLaren that have gone with the with a um, front pull rod suspension is for aero. Okay. So remember, as I said, the mounting point along the nose is lower, which means that from the, you know, the upright to the lower uh, mounting point in the nose, you're going to be sloping down, which means you now have a much larger sort of a hole in between the wishbones for air to flow into the side pod, into the cooling elements, right, of the engine. Um, 
So that is one of the reasons why you would do that is for an arrow reason. But every team is different, you know, because when you think of it, the car is truly a system. So let's start at the front. You've got the wing, which is shaping all of the air that's coming now through your suspension elements. And oh, by the way, your suspension elements are also shaping the air as well, because all of those rods and beams and things that are passing through there are shrouded with essentially what looks like almost like a wing, right? <laughs> so it makes it less draggy. But what that's doing is also shaping the air that's coming off of those suspension elements, pushing them down sometimes, pushing them out. Um, so all of that is shaping the air that's now interacting with your side pod or interacting with your floor entries, which is now shaping the air that's going to the rear of your car. So the whole thing is a system. And one team doing one thing doesn't necessarily mean it would be beneficial if say, you know, let's say Ferrari, if Ferrari just all of a sudden said, okay, we're going to implement now a pull rod front because it seems to be working for Red Bull, right? It doesn't work that way because the whole car is a system and it needs to work together. And so Red Bull in their system has found that their pull rod setup in the front is better for them aerodynamically. And actually, interestingly enough, there was an article that came out, um, just today, um, I have to remind myself of where it came from. It was an article from the race where they interviewed Adrian Newey. And Adrian Newey came out and said that he did the front and rear suspension for Red Bull for this RB18. And because deep down, Newey is an aero guy, I, that tells me that it's primarily for an aero reason, which is why Red Bull has done it this way. Sure, and I think it makes sense in that way too, because Red Bull always had that like approach of, I, I am like, in fact, you know what? I'm gonna segue this into the next question actually, which is about obviously your favorite team, and obviously the the wizard years, Adrian Newey. Like, why is it that you think that the the RB18 has been as impressive as it has? Because I would say maybe in terms of like um quality pace or one lap pace Ferrari just for now seems to just be maybe a bit more balanced but in terms of like long race pace even if Max doesn't qualify first we saw it even in the sprint race just um when he, I guess he didn't get a good start and then he was behind uh Leclerc and then he got the overtake done within the last three laps of the sprint race just it seems to be that this RB18 is very competitive, especially in like racing conditions or race fuel and in terms of its race pace as well. Like what is really the secret behind success so far, uh, Dr. Ups? And on top of that, I mean, minus the, the reliability issues as well. Like, do you think that there'll be any other upgrades or any other areas of the car that you think um, Red Bull will be working on to, to like sustain this level of performance? Yeah. Yeah, no, good question. Um, yeah, I I am a Red Bull fan. Um, so for <laughs> for all your viewers or your your listeners, but I respect the heck out of Mercedes. Um, I worked for three and a half years in Germany, and you know got quite close to a lot of the Mercedes stuff that was going on down there. But um, and and Ferrari, I mean, as a whole, I think these are the three top teams, and you can never count any of these teams out. Period. Mm. They've got championship pedigree, right? So even though you know, Red Bull and Ferrari seems to have got it right, right off the start. I mean, I have no doubt Mercedes is right behind them for sure. Um, but with that said, what did, what did Red Bull get right, you know, from the start? I think right off the bat, they seem to have gotten the aero side of things correct, right? So they obviously, you know, don't suffer from porpoising as much as other teams. That same uh, the race article that I just mentioned previously, you know, they asked they asked Adrian New about that, and he said that um, from his you know experience with LMP cars, you know, um, that Le Mans prototype is what LMP stands for for anybody that might not know. So from the Le Mans prototype cars experience that he had, that they suffered quite a bit from the porpoising. So basically, as they were designing the car, they tried to be very mindful of that. Now, I'm sure other teams did the same thing, right? And probably it was a bit luck of the draw that maybe, you know, Red Bull was able to get the right ingredients together to make the whole uh, cake work, right? Um, and and I think aerodynamically, that's certainly one of the things they got right um, from the start is that the car is rapid. 
I mean, it's very fast in a straight line. Um, if you look at the aerodynamic efficiency, so what is the aerodynamic efficiency? I mean, the, it's the ratio of the drag to, you know, to the lift to drag that you get. So um, essentially, you know, if you have now downforce generating elements, those downforce generating elements are also going to have a drag associated with them. And that's going to be the penalty you're going to pay. But the efficiency of the car is going to be that you're going to be able to generate a lot of downforce without taking a big penalty in drag. Mm -hmm. And so the Red Bull definitely has that. And we saw that in, in Australia, actually, when Red Bull changed from a low downforce setup to more of a little bit higher downforce setup because they were chasing Ferrari who seemed to have a lot more downforce and more grip. So they tried to, to sort of complement that by increasing the amount of downforce they have. And we saw that the penalty that they paid on the straights was very minimal. So they didn't drop a lot of speed as a result of now increasing their downforce, which tells you it's a very aero efficient car. So that's the thing that they got right on the reliability side. Yeah. I mean, I think they very clearly have some issues with the fuel system that seems to be sorted now, um, which caused some of their DNFs. Um, Imola was a clean race. So hopefully that's a sign of, of good things to come, but the aero development is very trick. When you look at the underfloor of the car and the tunnels, it's very shaped and very sculpted. Um, I'll give you a really good example. If you put the Red Bull floor and the Ferrari force floor side by side, and now for any Tifosi that's that's listening, um, the the Ferrari has not upgraded their floor yet. <laughs> Let's just say that. But then Red Bull has. So Ferrari is really on their first version of the floor. But the Red Bull floor, um, as far as the entries go, the entry tunnels and the strakes are extremely sculpted and designed. So they're not the same continuous sort of an arc. You can tell there's some engineering sort of design and intent that went into the shape. Additionally, that center section we talked about before, the boat section, is actually stepped. It's not a continuous sort of an arc around to the rear diffuser. It has an entry step before it expands laterally, and then it has a has an exit sort of a, a step down into the diffuser. So it's actually expanding laterally, which is very unique. It's very different than what other teams are doing. So when I look at the arrow, the arrow is top notch. So I think if we're talking like three up, three down, we've got, um, what did they get wrong now? The three things they got wrong. I think I would say the weight, right? I mean, it was incredibly heavy. Depending on whose rumors you want to believe, I've heard at some points they were 20 kilograms over, <laughs> which is <Jeez>. crazy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, if that's true. Um, but, you know, it's probably not that much. But they did roll out an upgrade in MLO, which seems to have really helped them with their pace. That finally, now, if you look at average race pace, they were actually faster than Ferrari, which was not the way previously, right? So it seems like dropping weight really did help them. Um, what other things, you know, did they get wrong? I think probably the fuel issues that we spoke about. And to anybody that says that what Red Bull did last year in 2021 to develop the car throughout the year did not affect them in 2022, I just don't see how that's possible um, because you only have a certain amount of time that you can allocate to engineering design, right? I think naturally they prioritize some things over maybe other things. I think they did prioritize the arrow maybe over, say, some of the other things like the fuel system, right? Um, and that's probably why they suffered a bit from there. They were still kind of learning as the as as the first couple of races, uh, you know, went on and they, they made some mistakes very clearly with the new E10 fuel. So that's another bad thing. And I think the third thing, I would say the third down item is traction. Um, that Ferrari has massive traction. I mean, if you just look at the telemetry tra traces and you see the throttle position and Denz, I mean, you can appreciate this cause you're a sim racer, man. So like yeah. the, how you, <laughs> How you feather the throttle through a corner is so important, right? Because when you're going through a corner, you've only got so much grip. And I think of it as like a cup, okay? You got a cup and then you can, and that cup is, is a capped. You know, if you put too much water into it, it's going to spill over the sides, right? And that cup is basically the amount of grip that you have. 
and you can you can take a portion of your grip and you can put it to acceleration or you can put it to turning or you can put it all to turning and none to acceleration you can put it all to braking and none to turning right so everything that you're going to now do whether it be braking acceleration or turning is going to fill that cup up some a portion and if you are now if able to say turn and get into the throttle earlier you're going to have a much quicker exit out of that corner than your competition who's struggling more for grip because they're having to use all the energy just to turn the car and can't actually put energy into accelerating it now again exactly. think of the cup right so um that is where ferrari oh. got it right and i don't think Red Bull has quite got it right yet is on the exit traction because all of the um, very technical sectors of the racetracks where you've got a lot of, you know, maybe middle speed to low speed corners, it requires you to have a lot of exit traction. They're struggling in those areas and, and Ferrari's just kind of, uh, you know, sort of pulling away from them in those sections as well. So I, I think for me, um, what I would do is, you know, I, I would really put a lot of focus into the weight savings if it was my car. And I would really say, you know, saving weight and trimming weight is going to is going to benefit you in all those areas. Right. It's going to affect you positively in the corners because you're going to have less inertia. You have to turn through the corner, which is going to now require less grip. So maybe you can also get more traction out of the corner as a result of that. So I would focus a lot of my uh, time and energy into trying to bring the weight down. Which is a challenge, though, uh, in the cost cap era that we're in, because what does that mean? That means that you're going to have to now probably go with higher tier components and materials that have a higher strength to weight ratio, which means they cost more money, right? And you, that's all great for the first car that you build, but what happens when you wreck and now you need True. spare parts? All those spare parts are going to be more expensive and you've got to think of the cost cap. This is so true. And I agree with your sentiments there as well, Dr. Hobbs, in relation to this, trying to find that balance of like, you know, trying to keep it within the cost cap, but then trying to find that extra like bit of performance. And we've seen it because, for example, the Williams, I think by the end of the, the year, Dr. Hobbs, I think the Williams is just going to be a carbon fiber tub. Like every week, <laughs> they just remove and strip a little bit of paint here, a little bit of paint there, you know, a little bit off the engine cover. But they, they're doing It looks these pretty things. clean though, you know, it looks pretty good. I actually I like, like it. it too. Same here. Like I yeah. actually... Um, not adverse to them doing that because it just makes it look more like a race car but i understand kind of from the other kind of point of view the sponsors of course are going to want to you know have a car that's maybe a bit more eye-catching you've seen that with like lp and having it's already only been four races and they've had two liveries so you know each yeah. team will have their own kind of uh you know like kind of sentiments with that as well and it's amazing that even in terms of just like the commercial aspect you know how that also plays a role in the performance of the car because i guess if you're alpine you obviously want to bring the weight down and make the car as uh, you know streamlined as possible. But then also, you have a, a, a huge like you know partner being BWT that won everything plus everywhere and pink paint. You know, and I guess you could obviously <laughs> do that on the overalls and the helmets. But of course, the car is the thing that the camera sees the most of whilst it's on circuit. Absolutely. So. Yeah. Ah, it's yeah. crazy. But um, Dr. Ups, I'm really conscious, you know, of us obviously us taking your time. And I really, really love the fact that you've been on the podcast with us. We need you definitely for another episode because I just want to delve in to. more into, you know, like, you know, your background, how you got into it a bit more as well. Maybe some of the, the technical um, challenges that you faced in the roles that you've done. But uh, with it being the Miami GP, as uh, my little cheerful song at the beginning went, I just <laughs> wanted to get uh, your... Um, for the final question, it's like your top yeah. three predictions for this race. Oh, I love hot takes. I never shy away from hot takes. And I'm, <laughs> I'm also ready to get roasted if I'm wrong. So um, first hot take is that Miami is going to perform similar to Imola in the sense that to me, the track looks similar in a sense, but the the biggest difference is going to be the DRS zone. So, so I guess first hot take is that um, as far as you know, 
the number of stops we're going to have is going to be a one stop. It's going to be probably similar to Imola in that sense. The second hot take is going to be that the DRS zones, and maybe this one's not as hot of a take, but the DRS zones in Miami are going to be extremely powerful um, because they're very long DRS zones. And um, the only downside of it is that when you look at the track itself, um, I think I'm going to have to remind myself which turn it is. It's turn 17. Um, turn 17 is going to be extremely hard braking zone off of that super long straight between 16 and 17. And the other hot take that I have is McLaren is going to struggle with brake temps. Um, we've we've seen it in some of the other races. I think it was uh, it was Jeddah, right? They were they were struggling with brake temps, or maybe it was Bahrain. But one of the two, they really were struggling with brake temps. So for me, um, I think McLaren is going to struggle with brake temps. I think the DRS zones are going to be extremely powerful, which means that we're probably going to have quite a bit of overtaking, which I would love. Um, and then the other one, uh, what was my first one? Uh, it's going to be like Imola. It's going to be similar to Imola. So to me, I think possibly the, the power cars with the big PUs, so... You know, Ferrari apparently is going to have an upgrade, by the way, to the engine, or maybe a, they're going to turn the wick up 15 have horsepower more. I mean, whoa. <laughs> you, know, that's you need all the tough. horses you can in this game. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, I guess so. So I think for me, yeah, it's it could be a similar sort of uh, outcome like we had in Imola um, during the race. But um, I'm going to be really interested to see what, what Mercedes brings um, to Miami. Um, I'm not sure. Do you know? Is there is there any rumors of any big upgrades or anything that Mercedes is going to bring to Miami? Well, this is the thing as well, man. Like a lot of the obviously the the Merck fans have been getting a bit like frustrated now with Mercedes because they've been saying that there is a huge like upgrade package coming to the car relatively soon, but the timing of it is a bit unfortunate because I think mm -hmm. they would have probably wanted to bring it to Imola, but then because of the revised format with the sprint races, they wouldn't have been able to get consecutive practice sessions to really see what they wanted to from that. Yeah, and then obviously yeah. with Miami, it's a completely new circuit as well where they have no historical data. So of course, they then also can't really do anything for that either. So I wouldn't be surprised if they, they tamp around with something just with the current version or guys of the car mm -hmm. we have. But I think we might unfortunately be holding out into a Barcelona, which I think will be a true test for this car and any upgrade yeah. they could bring just for, you know, that back to back comparison as well, because it's a track that they know quite well. They've got historical data. And of course, we had the um, the, the practice or the, uh, the test sessions there earlier on in the year as well. But like we said, you know, it's a completely new circuit. Anything yeah. could happen, as it always does in Formula One. And, uh, you know, like, obviously, look, well, Russell's is hungry, and I've never seen a guy hungrier. And I'm, <laughs> I'm all for it, so I love that. But yeah. then also, as well, you know, you don't become a seven, hashtag, or asterisk eight world time champion in Lewis as well, <laughs> you know, and the level of experience and composure. And, you know, he has had right. a bit of an un un unlucky kind of fortune at the moment, but it can all turn yeah. around. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. He... I mean, the, you know, and that's the thing. I think, I think, by the way, that there's way too much heat and too much smoke around this whole George Russell Lewis Hamilton thing. I mean, yeah. poor Lewis has been really just a, uh, you know, unfortunate recipient of some just really bad circumstances and situations. I mean, look at what happened in Imola during qualifying, right? I mean, with Carlos Sainz ended up crashing in Q2 before Lewis could really put it on a, you know, a strong lap. Um, and, and George, I mean, during, and then during the race, what happened, right? Why did, why was George propelled so far forward? I mean, because Danny Rick ended up taking Kyle Carlos, right? And yeah. then it just sort of, the water sort of parted for George and he just kind of, yeah, he took it, right? And that didn't sure. unfortunately happen for Lewis. So it's kind of like, George is a great driver. I truly believe it. Um, Lewis obviously has... I mean, he's, he's, he does, he's got nothing to prove, right? I mean, he, everybody knows he's, you know, one of the greatest ever. So, um, you know, you don't go from being, you know, the greatest ever to now all of a sudden some midfield schlub, you know, it doesn't happen like that, right? So I think exactly. it's just been the unfortunate circumstances that have sort of put Lewis a bit on the back foot and in some of these DRS trains and, yeah, the car isn't exactly helping him either. So um, I think once the car gets sorted and everything, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing um, 
you know, Lewis back up there and, and George as well. Absolutely. Well, Dr. Ubbs, it's been a pleasure. And before you leave as well, could you tell, give us like your handle? Where can we find you? Where can the listeners like, you know, um, obviously follow you and get like any insights as well? And um, is there anything that you're working on upcoming or any other podcasts that you're doing? Because we'd love to tune in and give you some support as well. Yeah, definitely. So um, so I met at Dr. Underscore OBS, OBBS. Uh, on Twitter, so you can follow me there. Um, I like to pretty much produce original content as much as possible. So you'll see a lot of sort of, you know, original takes and things like that if you follow me. So if you're into that kind of thing in F1, uh, you know, F1 tech, definitely give me a follow. Um, yeah, I like to participate in a few podcasts. So this much fun on stripping the dip and i mean i and i love the name too so I'm, I'm down with that so i would love to join you all again i've also been on um you know the drs zone um as well with with Rhett, who i think you know also so that yeah been, that's been a lot of fun tune into that um Rhett and i got a good vibe as well we take a bit more of a kind of a u.s motorsport angle which is a an emerging area right i mean the u.s is just blowing up right now for formula one which i think is fantastic um so yeah that, that those are a few things that 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 are coming up for me um also uh after a lot of races um you know you can find me in some of the twitter spaces with our friend uh bryson sullivan as well um just kind of asking questions or maybe leading some of my own uh twitter spaces as well so yeah give me a shout it's been a lot of fun um i'd love to come back yeah we can we can talk shop some more and talk more tech this is fun. Oh, well, listen, this is just the first of many, Dr. Hobbs. I'm honestly so appreciative it. of your time and also just your knowledge. Just I've learned so much. I've got like a little notepad, my infamous <laughs> Ted Kravitz notepad, you know, and I've jotted down a lot of stuff, which, you know, I've taken away. And I'm sure it will be a very similar experience for our listeners as well. So it's an absolute honor to have you and we will have you very soon. So uh, thank you Appreciate as it. always. And yeah, guys, listeners at home, I hope that you will have a great uh, start to the month with it being May. Feeling Floyd in this May weather. Had to put that in there. <laughs> and of course, you know, um, race week <laughs> as well in Miami. So we hope that you guys enjoy that. And until next time, take it easy, stay prosperous and healthy, and we shall catch you guys soon. Peace. <laughs>